Welcome everyone to today's webinar, which is one in a series of presentations from YSI. And today we're going to discuss lake, estuary, and tidal monitoring using small and portable platforms. So before we begin, I have just a few housekeeping announcements. First, this presentation is being recorded and, will, and it will be made available to you after the event. And second, our presentation today will last approximately 45 minutes and we will leave time at the end for your questions. So you may ask a question by typing it into the questions window uh, that you'll see in your menu bar. Now uh, we'll get started and I'll turn it over to one of our two presenters, Tim Finnegan. Thanks for that introduction, Danielle. Well, before we get into all the details, I just want to do a quick agenda of what we're going to cover today. We're going to start off by talking about the evolution of floating platforms. A number of folks in the line are starting uh, continuous monitoring systems and, interest, and interested in starting a uh, floating, uh, uh, floating platform monitoring network. So we'll talk a little bit about how that evolves. Then we'll break it into two different groups. We'll focus on inland monitoring and Susan will talk specifically about an example on Kentucky Lake. And then I'll step back in and talk about some of the coastal monitoring aspects of floating systems, including how you deploy them and some new sensor technology uh, like CDOM and CO2 that YSI is developing. Towards the end, we'll give you a quick overview of two of the platforms we're going to focus on today, the EMM68 and the Pisces platform. And at the end, we'll show you a new anti-fouling system that we're using on one of our floating platforms that uses a flow cell and pump to bring water up and reduce biofouling. So real quickly about me, uh, my name is Tim Finnegan. I'm an engineer with YSI. Uh, I've been with YSI for 10 years and we've been in business as YSI for over 60 years as an instrumentation company. Uh, I work for the systems division where we actually take third-party products, standard YSI products, and integrate them together using data loggers and modems, oftentimes on floating platforms. And we'll talk through some of those today. But enough about me, let me, um, let me ask Susan to introduce herself and her program. Okay, hi, uh, thanks Tim. Um, my name is Susan Hendricks and I'm an aquatic ecologist at Murray State University located in Western Kentucky, USA. And I manage a, an NSF funded project for buoy IT and cyber infrastructure at Hancock Biological Station located on Kentucky Lake. Kentucky Lake is a main stand reservoir created by the Tennessee Valley Authority in 1944 and it's an impoundment of the Tennessee River. We've had a long-term water quality monitoring program since 1988 whereby we collect uh, physical, chemical, and biological data every 16 days at 16 sites on the lake. And recently we've added both uh, fixed and floating platforms to collect continuous high-frequency data on environmental conditions using multi-parameter SONs and also from meteorological instruments proximate to those SONs. The buoy platform, buoy platforms supplement our long-term monitoring data collection and are located in embayments of the lake that reflect different watershed land uses, primarily agricultural on the west side of the lake and forested um, uh, watersheds on the east side. Because precipitation events cause rapid change in these watersheds, we need high frequency monitoring of water and solute fluxes from each of those watershed types in order to better understand the effects on Kentucky Lake. And with that, I'll get back to Tim and Danielle. Thanks, Susan. Well, I'm going to quickly talk to uh, moving from fixed monitoring sites to floating platforms. Uh, obviously, a fixed platform is the easiest way to start a monitoring program. Simply attaching a PVC pipe to a permanent structure is a great way to get a secure monitoring site. Using a locking well cap can help prevent vandalism. However, some of the drawbacks of fixed sites are getting access or permits, and there can tend to be microenvironment or flushing issues associated with fixed sites. Lastly, it's important to get representative sample, and sometimes you're limited where you can sample to where you have a permanent structure. Because of some of those trade-offs, people have turned to floating platforms as an alternative. So they can be 
relocated for short-term studies. And I'll talk a little bit about two specific platforms that can be really set up and deployed with very little resources. Uh, those would be the 68 buoy and our Pisces pontoon platform. And these can be, again, put in place just using a small truck or a small Boston whaler or rowboat. Uh, floating platforms don't limit you to the shoreline like a fixed site may. However, they also have some challenges that we'll talk in greater detail during this webinar. Some of those challenges are mooring design, the need for submersible rated connectors, there's different power requirements, and frankly, you're limited on real estate. I want to show just the, kind of the evolution of floating platforms by sharing some images or photos of uh, various floating platform solutions we've used over the years. On the screen, we have a very basic floating platform. It's simply a float attached to a multi-parameter sond. So this system, the advantage is it will actually stay a fixed distance from the water surface. So as the tide changes, as the reservoir fills, you are sampling it at the same depth from surface all the time. However, you're limited to internal batteries and internal power in this case. Another example of a common fixed site would be a PVC pipe I mentioned earlier. But you can see from this photo a significant amount of biofouling that can sometimes require the use of a diver to clean. And you're also actually limited to where you can mount one of these structures. As you can tell maybe from the surrounding picture, this is relatively close to the shoreline and may not be the optimal sampling location. The next level of complexity is to add telemetry and power solutions to the mix. So this is a box that would normally be placed on the shoreline. And then we would run a cable through a conduit out to a monitoring site. Again, the next level of complexity, in this case, we have a, a piling where we've attached a PVC pipe and used a data logger and spread spectrum technology telemetry on the surface. This is effectively a data link back to the shore where data is displayed on a computer. In this case, we are able to get a little further offshore but that's only because the water depth was relatively shallow. Once you exceed uh, four or five meters, it can become more difficult to drive a piling or locate a fixed structure. That's, again, where the use of a floating platform can be beneficial. Again, another order of complexity here. We have a floating platform, and you can see we now have metrological sensors installed. But on this platform specifically, we have a motorized winch it actually raises and lowers a cable on a water quality sond. We call this a vertical profiler platform. This poses some challenges both with the mooring and deployment. Power budgets are important and telemetry is a big issue. Keep on moving in orders of complexity. Here's a system we deployed off the coast of Kuwait. Now this is a very large system just because there's vessel traffic. We have redundant communications, redundant monitoring systems and measuring parameters like currents, waves, and water quality. And I'll kind of conclude this just by showing an example of a complex system we installed in the UAE. This actually measures heavy metals in the water. It measures nitrates, phosphates, ammonia, UV radiation, meteorological parameters, currents, waves. There's over 10 sensors and well over 100 parameters that are collected. There's redundant communications. My point with this slide is that when you're on a floating platform, the integration really becomes an issue. We have to consider how we're going to moor it, how much power we're going to have, and how you set up that floating platform. And we'll talk more to all of this in the future. But first, I wanted to talk about choosing an appropriate site. Some things are relatively easy to do when scouting a site for floating platforms. You can go out in a small boat and verify that your cell phone has three out of five bars. You can drop a line to actually get what the deployment depth will be. However, some issues are a little more abstract, namely the dynamics of the site. Lately, we've been using an Ecomapper AUV to run a mission to survey a lake. If you look at the photo on your left, you can see there's clearly an algae hotspot. Now, because of vegetation and inlet sources, this site tends to be a lot more dynamic than the majority of the lake. So when choosing to deploy a floating platform, we would put it here to get a more representative sample. Again, you can see in the photo on the left, other locations closer to the shore may not have been as dynamic or may not have been representative 
uh, as, of the system as a whole. So with that, I'd like to try and keep this interactive, and I'm going to pass it back to Danielle, who's going to get some information from you guys. Thanks, Tim. That was a good overview and introduction. And as you can see now, there's a, a poll on your screen. I would love to get some information from our audience to see where folks' interests lie. Uh, what kind of uh, environmental data collection are, are you doing? Um, spot sampling, six deployments, floating platforms. And if you um, simply click one of those buttons on your screen, you'll be able to vote in the poll. And we'll uh, keep that open for just a few more seconds while folks uh, g uh, type in their, or give us their answers. Um, what will be nice is that as we go throughout the presentation, we'll see both examples of uh, inland and freshwater uh, monitoring platforms as well as uh, coastal and estuarine platforms and the different applications for both of those. So just a few more seconds there for, uh, for on the voting. And uh, as you can see, we, it looks like we have a good mix of, uh, of uh, types of deployments, although uh, I think a lot of folks look like they're still using fixed platforms to some degree. Um, and so that's good. Thanks, everyone, for sharing those results. And now uh, we would like to turn it over to, back to uh, Susan to talk a little bit more about monitoring inland in lakes and watersheds. Okay, thanks, uh, Daniel. Um, we have, we've had a fixed site for deploying sensors on Kentucky Lake since 2005. It consists of a three-pylon navigation light, as you can see on the uh, left-hand side of the slide. And it's at the side of the main shipping channel in Kentucky Lake. And depending on the time of year, the water depth is anywhere between 2.5 to 4.5 meters deep. And I have to add that the water levels are managed by, um, seasonally by TVA and the Army Corps of Engineers at the dam. Uh, so our fixed site deployment consists of a 40-watt solar panel with a 12-volt battery, a data logger, a line-of-sight uh, line radio telemetry for transmitting data back to the server at um, Hancock Biological Station, and two YSI multi-parameter SONs mounted one meter below the water surface and one meter above the lake bottom. And you can see in the picture um, on the right side of the slide all the parameters that we are measuring from those data SONs. The weather station serving the site is actually on, on the rooftop of HBS about a quarter of a mile away. Um, we find that the advantages of the fixed site include ease of access. It's right close to where we are, so we can uh, we have easy. It's easy to repair, calibrate, or replace any of the equipment, and we can see it from the biological station. Um, the disadvantages are potential dangerous barge traffic, uh, potential vandalism. Um, sometimes uh, lightning strikes may affect it. And we always have flooding issues here on Kentucky Lake. So, um, but so far we've had pretty good luck and have had only one 100-year flood to deal with. And in that case, we had to shut everything down for a while. Uh, and we also had only one lightning strike. Um, so we have had some difficulties, but we are very happy and satisfied with this uh, arrangement. Um, as for our floating platforms, we've had a Pisces model buoy equipped with MET instruments for air temperature, PAR, uh, precipitation, wind speed and direction, barometric pressure. Uh, there's a GPS unit and a beacon on top. Um, there are six small solar panels on various parts of the buoy, a Campbell CR1000 data logger in the yellow box on the right side, a 12-volt battery in the box on the left side, and finally, a, a YSI multi-parameter sond that goes into a protective sleeve, sleeve down the center of the buoy into the water to a depth of one meter. The water quality parameters that are measured every 15 minutes include water temp, DO, pH, ORP, specific conductance, turbidity, chlorophyll A, and phycocyanin. And we also have a non-YSI CDOM sensor deployed next to the sond in another sleeve 
for a total of nine water quality parameters. The buoy has a two-point tether anchoring uh, system, uh, cell phone communications for transmitting data back to the server. And the advantages we see for this uh, type of deployment is ease of transport to remote sites anywhere, as you can see by the pickup. Uh, it's lightweight, and the ease of deployment from a boat ramp is great. Uh, maintenance is relatively easy, and the data logger can be programmed to accommodate additional sensors. Uh, disadvantages are cell phone, uh, which can be expensive after a while, so we are looking into other options such as satellite or line-of-sight radio transmission. Um, although not necessarily a disadvantage, I feel compelled to mention that it's very important that people need to be dedicated to buoy maintenance. It uh, needs a calibration schedule, especially if biofouling is an issue. You need daily monitoring of sensor performance from the office, which is what I do. You need rapid response if something goes wrong. You need, you need to be able to respond to potential problems that can be encountered on a busy recreational and transportation waterway. Uh, so far, we've had this particular buoy deployed about a mile and a half away from Hancock Biological Station since November 1st. And although we are still working out a few kinks, we are very satisfied with the long-term deployment performance of the sensors. Our second buoy has been launched into our own basin at the station for a little while now to make sure everything's working properly. And we will add another CDOM sensor in late March before we deploy into a second watershed embayment in April. Um, the map, um, the next slide will show a map of where, where all of our deployments are located. The fixed site has been operational since February of 2005. So there's a six-year database associated with that. Pisces 1 went into an agricultural embayment on November 1, 2010. And Pisces 2 will be deployed in the forested watershed at Panther Creek sometime in April 2011. OK, and then the, the next slide um, shows our um, database water quality monitoring that's available to other people. But first, uh, I, can't ex I can't stress more the need for dedicated database management and IT personnel who are committed to staying on top of whatever, uh, whatever is captured by the sensors. You need to have proper data storage and management and willingness to troubleshoot any programming issues, calibration issues, maintenance issues, whatever. Matt Williamson is our go-to database manager who has been instrumental in setting up the database to receive all of this incoming data from the deployments. And we have a dedicated field technologist, Carrie Rice, who's in charge of keeping all the instruments going, uh, calibrating, cleaning, etc., and just staying on top of everything at all levels. It's not a casual op operation. You really need to have people dedicated to this work. And on this slide, I just want to uh, emphasize uh, what is available to the public or to agencies interested in Kentucky Lake water quality. Uh, TVA uses our data. We've seen our data up on the Weather Channel on occasion to describe fishing conditions. We also know our data are accessed by uh, government agencies in Kentucky that are interested in water quality. So anyone can get on this website and do a query for any data they are interested in. Scientists also have other options for data through other portals and tools. And with that, I, I'll pass this back to Danielle and Tim. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Susan. Uh, I have a quick question for you from the audience. Uh, folks are wondering if you needed a permit to launch that floating platform. Um, we did not need a permit per se, but we did talk to all of the stakeholders in Kentucky Lake, which include Tennessee Valley Authority, the Corps of Engineers, and the U.S. Coast Guard, who maintains the uh, pylons that we actually have our equipment attached to. They were all very congenial and willing to help. We did not have to have special permission, but we did feel it necessary to involve them and notify them that we were installing this equipment. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, so for, the, uh, for everyone out there, we have our second poll, and that's uh, now live, and folks are... Um, voting, so uh, please take note of that. We're, we're interested in knowing what kind of uh, environment, water body you're monitoring in. Um, as we just discussed, uh, Susan went over some freshwater uh, information, 
and um, next we'll get into some estuary and coastal saltwater uh, applications as well. So we'll leave the poll open uh, for just a few more seconds. Okay, and um, as you can see, we have a, a pretty predominant freshwater audience with us today. So I sure hope that, uh, that Susan's information was, uh, was useful to you so far, and uh, feel free to keep sending in some questions that you might have for her that um, we can answer at the end of the presentation. And uh, the next section we're going to go through uh, will deal with uh, some coastal and estuary monitoring. And I know one f uh, person had a question about mooring, and so that's uh, what we're going to discuss next. So hopefully that'll, that'll be informative to them. Tim, back to you. Well, my thanks to both Danielle and uh, Susan. Uh, I'm going to quickly run through deployment of coastal and estuary systems, and of course a lot of this applies to uh, floating platforms in general. On the screen we have a system uh, in front of us using a single point mooring. And what's unique about this type of setup on a floating platform is actually that all the instrumentation is contained at the surface of the buoy. And so a single point mooring will work out fine even as that buoy moves or turns in circles. Uh, one unique characteristic of this type of setup is the fact that we have uh, ADP, a coastal ADP or current profiler, at the surface of the buoy. And this is actually sending beams down. And so we had to use a special mooring setup where we have a section of weighted chain to keep the mooring outside of the uh, acoustic path of the beams. However, when you have a single point mooring, what you have to consider is the buoy motion. So it's much like you have a boat on an anchor there is going to be a watch circle or swing path that that buoy or floating platform is going to operate within. And when wind comes from different directions, that can have a lot of impact on your mooring design. And I'll spend some time talking about that in future slides. But one thing that's really important is if you have other instrumentation, say a thermistor string is very common in floating platform applications where they are looking to measure thermoclines or stratification. That can be a challenge to have sensors hanging off the buoy and have the buoy motion that we see in this diagram. In those cases, we do something like a two-point mooring. So in this case, we have two lengths of chain, and in the future slide, I'll talk about how to create your own mooring. But we also have an electromechanical cable. And what this allows you to do is deploy, uh, in this case, a current and wave meter in the most economical manner. Uh, by simply putting an electromechanical cable at the bottom, we're able to get uh, wave and current data at a relatively affordable price. But you can see the addition of that third sensor cable coming off the side really prevents you from using a single point mooring. Um, you need to use a two point mooring so that uh, that sensor cable doesn't get wrapped up in things. Same concept when you have, say, a thermistor chain hanging off the side. You have to be very cognizant of how those sensors are going to interact with the mooring. Also, in this case, we actually have metrological sensors installed up top. And another consideration with the single point mooring is the floating platform will move. And you're going to need a compass installed to actually correct for changes in direction as that buoy moves. Using a two-point taut mooring minimizes that effect, so some customers get away without a compass. However, um, sometimes we still use one to correct for buoy motion and correct for wind direction. This is a diagram of actually deploying a system uh, without all of the uh, infrastructure at the top. In this case, we could deploy something like the green box we showed earlier on shore, which will supply power and telemetry, and then run a cable conduit down. Uh, we have a top mooring line here, and this allows us to actually deploy a sonde at a fixed distance from either the bottom or some users actually deploy a system hanging from the top, which is, allows us to have a fixed distance from the surface. In this way, we still get data that's referenced either to the surface or the bottom, but we don't have a floating platform. We actually have a long cable run. Some disadvantages of this cable run are you need to have some form of abrasion resistance, um, and you also lose signal and power, so you have to upgrade to usually a 45 transmission system. 
And in some cases with really long cable runs, uh, cable runs in the order of a mile, you'd have to put a high voltage supply to send that, um, send that power down the wire as it would effectively get lost, um, it, it'd get lost as it transmits through the cable. So other considerations with mooring is servicing the site. As Susan alluded to earlier, maintenance is one of the most important aspects of any monitoring program. In this case, we're actually employing what's called a pickup line. So a customer could come up in a small vessel and actually retrieve the pickup line first. This just has a small float, and they bring that into the boat, and they pick up a relatively small anchor. Then you muscle up the anchor underneath that's actually supporting the larger buoy over here on the left. And the last step is to simply remove the floating platform from the water. So this system is really easy for a small crew of one or two people to actually maintain because it allows you to handle the individual pieces. Instead of pulling up the floating platform and having to worry about the anchor, you can kind of handle it in pieces. Um, Two of the systems we'll talk a little bit more about, the EMM-68, you can just tell by the general size of it, this is something that a single person can handle from a small boat or small platform. The other mooring issue I wanted to talk about was a two versus one point mooring. In this case, we have a floating platform, the Pisces system, and this is great to use a two point mooring if the prevailing wind and the surface currents generally come from one direction. This will do a very good job of riding those waves and absorbing the energy. However, what you have to be careful of, if your wind and waves actually change directions and actually come in broadside, perpendicular against the platform, that can cause a lot of rocking. And any platform that is on a taut two-point mooring, subject to waves on one side, um, can actually absorb a lot of that energy and impact the monitoring. So in this case, we might actually only use a single point mooring, and that will allow the floating platform to move along with the changes in wind and waves, like we saw in that watch circle diagram. So uh, for those folks on the line who are interested in kind of creating their own mooring, this is something that can easily be done to save costs. Um, a lot of this stuff is available at a local marine supplier. And that usually always starts with the shackle that's attached to the floating platform. And we usually use a section of galvanized chain. And what this does is it allows you to control where the mooring's at at the surface so it's not interfering with your sensors. But it also actually helps provide a writing moment to help pull the buoy and keep it upright. Now, if you're using a single point mooring, it's imperative that you always use a swivel. And a swivel is going to prevent the rope and the chain from binding up as the system is continually moving around in that watch circle. You'd use another shackle. And then we like to use Dacron fiber rope for the majority of our moorings. The reason we use this is because it's relatively light and easy to deploy. Um, it's a cost-effective solution. And you have to keep in mind when you deploy a floating system, most of the weight is at the surface and supported by the floats. So the amount of weight you actually have to support on the mooring is relatively small. In that fact, it's like a bobber on the surface of the water. As you get down towards the bottom, it's important that you use a section of galvanized chain again. And this is actually to help prevent any interference from the rope abrading on the anchor in the deployment mechanism. So here we have the anchor which is step number nine, down at the bottom. And sizing that anchor is another thing that can be somewhat dynamic, dependent on the currents, the size of your floating platform, the depth of water. But I would encourage you guys with specific mooring questions to ask us, and we can try and make recommendations so that you can go and um, design your own mooring system. So I want to shift gears a little bit. I know a lot of the folks here were actually doing inland monitoring, but I want to talk about some of the new uh, sensor technologies that can be used. Uh, CDOM and CO2. I'll start off with CO2. That's obviously um, a parameter of growing importance. As CO2 gases increase in the atmosphere, they interact with the water to form carbonic acid. This actually decreases the pH 
and generally it's referred to as ocean acidification. So actually being able to measure CO2 and pH on the same system is a real benefit. There's a lot of funding and grant money that has been put into this and YSI is developing a solution to add CO2 to an existing 6600 sond. This technology uses um, NDIR um, displacement infrared technology but it actually has a glower inside there that stays on all the time. This increases the current draw of your system. In this case with CO2 installed it may draw 110 milliamps continuously. So going back to the floating platform we have to make sure there's enough solar panel and enough reserve power to keep the system operational given the current loads that are on here. That goes into sizing what platform you use and it's also very dependent on latitude. So depending on the total number of sunlight hours will dictate what size panels we need to use. Another development that we've uh, released is a sensor adapter and this allows customers uh, to choose the best sensor for the application even if YSI doesn't manufacture it. This adapter allows any of the Turner series Cyclops 7 sensors to be adapted to any existing 6600 sond with an optical port. So the advantage of this system is in the field, the field technician can directly install the sensor adapter and choose a refined fuel or CDOM sensor and install that directly on the device. It also simplifies the integration that uh, Susan alluded to with the Campbell data logger and the IT side. Because the data is delivered directly inside the SON and the SON directly powers this adapter, it's very easy to upgrade or integrate uh, sensors like CDOM and hydrocarbons into an existing monitoring platform. Um, CDOM is used a lot where, uh, as a natural tracer or in wastewater discharge uh, for correcting satellite imagery, but uh, importantly CDOM can also impact the measurement of other sensors, which is a good reason to monitor it to understand its influence. Hydrocarbons is of increased importance not only in the Gulf after the oil spill, but in ports and harbor applications where you may have um, refined fuels or oil leaking into the water. So quickly to walk through two of the platforms we talked about, the 68 buoy is a small platform that is uh, easy to deploy by a single person. We have our guy uh, Nick down in Australia. He was doing a quick study in the bay, a telemetry test, uh, before moving that site further offshore for a long-term study. Another important thing to consider if you're designing your own monitoring platform is the cabling and interconnect. We use an RF transparent polymer that, is in re that resides in that yellow part that I've circled. We call it the top hat. And effectively, we install the GPS, the antenna, the modem, the data logger, and all the interconnects inside that RF transparent case. That minimizes the need for connectors. Because of the close proximity of all the electronics to the water surface, connectors are a big problem, especially RF connectors. They generally can be one of the weakest links and first things to fail. So anytime you can minimize the connectors or exposure to the water is an advantage for reliability in your platform. The other platform we've alluded to actually comes in two varieties. It is the Pisces platform. And it's great for high flow applications. Because most of the mass of the Pisces buoy is above the water, it can actually ride on top of high energy waves and currents in riverine systems and where you have bidirectional bi bi ah, bi flow. And as Susan again alluded to, it's something that's relatively easy to deploy. So it has large uh, storage chests where you can add batteries, but yet it's light enough so four people can pick it out of a pickup truck and deploy it. So it's great for small term or small groups who have maybe fixed monitoring sites and are looking for a mobile platform that they can quickly deploy. Now more about those two configurations. The common configuration is to take a YSI multi-parameter sonde and deploy it at a fixed distance below the water surface. In this case, it's one meter. But a new configuration that YSI has developed 
is using a flow cell and peristaltic pump. So in this dual depth configuration, the sonde has been relocated to a sampling chest. There's two tubes that extend into the water. In this case, they're represented by a blue and red tube. These go through a peristaltic pump. They're controlled by a pinch valve. And then water flows into a flow cell so that you can sample from two different depths with a single sonde. Now, one of the main benefits of this type of system is the reduction of anti-fouling. And I have a couple photos. Uh, fortunately, this software doesn't allow me to show video very well, but I have a few screenshots that effectively try and illustrate how it works. Water comes in from one of the two tubes. In this case, it's red water. And it fills up this flow cell. As this flow cell fills, it purges the line to try and equilibrate sorry, equivalent, uh, <laughs> to try and minimize any temperature extremes. Uh, because we're using a peristaltic pump, uh, we are not introducing cavitation, so we are not impacting the turbidity or the DO readings. Um, depending on the temperature extremes between where your sampling intake is and what that sampling chest is at, there is a potential for some temperature deviation. In this photo, you can see that the chamber is now filled up with red liquid from the first inlet tube. Then we choose in the next, um, the next sampling to actually empty that tube. So you're going to see it transition to this next photo where we have an empty flow cell. And it's a little bit hard to see, but effectively the majority of the time this flow cell sits empty in a humid environment. It remains humid to keep the sensors hydrated but it doesn't allow biofouling to accumulate on the sonde. And then again, we can take another reading uh, through the second tube, and we're actually having blue water come in from the second sampling point, filling up this flow cell and taking a reading. So this is a new anti-fouling system, and it's a way to kind of double your sampling points uh, through the use of a single, um, single water quality sonde. So uh, we're running against our uh, deadline here. We've spent about 40 minutes talking to you guys. And I think we'll take this opportunity to stop and try and answer some of the questions that came in. If we don't get to all your questions, please uh, feel free to continue to write them in, and we'll try and follow up um, after the webinar. Great. Tim? Susan, thank you very much for your presentation. And I'll uh, throw out a couple questions to either one of you to answer. And, um, and these are from the, from the audience. Um, why don't we start with Susan? There's a, a few for you as folks took a look at the um, Pisces system uh, that you deployed on Kentucky Lake. Uh, one question was about the uh, weight of the Pisces. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Well, uh, as far as what, what it weighs when we deploy it, it's uh, not very heavy. Um, a couple of people can pick it up and put it in the water. And um, we worried at first about it being top heavy, but it's not. And so once we anchored it, uh, we oriented it in the direction of uh, our wind and water uh, wind direction so that uh, it was parallel to the direction of the wind and also parallel to most of the water flow. 90% of the time it comes out of the southwest, so we were able to orient the anchoring of uh, the Pisces in those directions, in that direction. Um, it, it's, it's lightweight, and like I said, we, we've had no problems working with it, uh, either pulling it ashore to work with it or uh, deploying it from um, uh, a pickup truck or some other mode of transportation and then okay. towing it to wherever we need to go. Great, great. And could you also talk a little bit uh, about some of the uh, water quality sensors? Um, folks wanted to know what you're using for chlorophyll A and for dissolved oxygen and um, how often uh, you find that you have to calibrate those sensors? 
Well, we have a, a fairly regular calibration scheme where we go out once every um, couple of weeks, every two weeks, and check on the sensors. I monitor the sensors from my, my computer on my desktop and make sure that they are, are running um, properly or at least sending data back that are consistent. If I notice that they're inconsistent, uh, we sending data back, then we go out and we look at the sensors. But we, we have a fairly um, consistent calibration schedule. We, we, uh, um, we're calibrating according to the manufacturer's uh, recommendations. Uh, we use a um, zero point calibration for chlorophyll A and uh, then for dissolved oxygen, I can't remember, let's see, uh, that is just calibrated in the lab. We bring the sensors back to the lab and calibrate them here. We have enough SONs, I have to say this, we have enough SONs to take out and switch them out so that we're not losing lots of data from the environment as we are bringing things back to the lab to be calibrated. So it always helps to have a couple of extra SONs to switch out. Um, I think that's, that's about all I have to say. Great. Thanks, Susan. Uh, calibration is always one of the biggest questions. There's a number of them that came in, and I'll talk to that a little bit. One question I got was, how often do you need to calibrate YSI sensors? before biofouling is present. And unfortunately, there's no stock answer that works. When I used to live in Louisiana, uh, we would go out and DO is the limiting factor. In the summer months, in the warm, stagnant water, we, we had to calibrate DO every two weeks. Um, in the winter months, we were actually able to go on the order of four to five weeks. The introduction of uh, optical DO and some of the anti-copper fouling screens can extend those deployments a little bit longer. So typically under ideal conditions, you could say two months is the best case, but certainly uh, the real world, uh, biofouling is a limiting factor, and um, that can just go down from there. The use of copper-based uh, protectants, and um, we have a new sea spray technology that's a, nanopoly it's a micro coating that makes it very slick and hard for that biofouling to catch, but it is always going to be site specific. The other question I have here was, um, how do we measure phosphate in the buoy that I showed in UAE? And that, unfortunately, there's no really easy way to measure phosphate. In the case of the UAE buoy, we were using wet chemistry online analyzers. Those actually required reagents and sampling and were relatively expensive. Another question I have here was, do platforms collect data in real time, or is it stored or retrieved? Well, in a 68 buoy, we can certainly configure that with just solar panel and batteries. That will only supply power to the devices and have them log on board. To get real-time data, you generally then have to put a data logger in place and a modem in place. Now, if it's cellular modem, cellular modem you're going to have to pay a monthly bill on the order of 50 bucks a month. If you can set up a situation where you have an office on shore and you can see that buoy, you can use spread spectrum radio technology, which is license free, and that can operate um, continuously as long as you have a line of sight. Okay, great. Thanks, Tim. Uh, we have lots of questions coming in, and, and we'll answer several more. And uh, for Susan uh, and for, for Tim, uh, here's one that maybe you can comment on some of your experiences with the small buoys. Uh, what are some of the ways that uh, you may have prevented vandalism uh, with these monitoring platforms? Uh, Susan, do you, do you want to comment on what you yeah. guys do? Um, yeah, I can comment. Uh, it's kind of tongue-in-cheek. We have a webcam on there so we can see who is approaching. And uh, we have had absolutely no trouble with vandalism. Uh, we also have uh, placed research uh, stickers, Hancock Biological Station uh, stickers on the um, buoy to notify what people of what, what this platform is all about and what we're trying to do. And we haven't had any, any vandalism of, of any, anything on our 
our either our fixed site or our floating platforms. Now, uh, I will say that in the summer, our, our buoy has only been out since November. I don't know how this is going to uh, survive a busy recreational summer situation, but um, thus far we've had no problems. And I'll just add on that, you know, we've seen in novel solutions, uh, when I've worked on deploying these systems around the world, such as danger, high voltage, stay off. Um, but the simple answer is all the systems, uh, well, the 68 buoy, as an example, has a place for a padlock. So you can padlock the hinge and at least keep, keep people from opening it up, stealing a sonde, or disconnecting the cables. Uh, in terms of what prevents someone from actually picking up the buoy and running away with it, that usually goes into using chain and using um, a heavy enough weight so that they actually can't pull that out of the water. Um, vandalism is always a concern. Um, usually putting, this is environmental research, please do not disturb, and putting a padlock on there is been sufficient in most examples. We have lots of questions coming in about ice measurements, um, and that is a challenging environment. The 68 buoy, the one here that's actually on the left of the screen, uses something called IMR foam. It's a closed cell foam, and that can actually be punctured. It can take bullets, and you can take impacts. You can have cracks in it. It should have 30 years of use. This stuff is pretty much indestructible. And that would be suitable for an ice type of deployment where you have small freeze overs. However, you have to keep in mind also the water quality sensors. So these are optical probes, electromechanical probes, there's a pH glass bulb, there's a conductivity cell that requires a flow around it. And if those sensors were to be encased in ice, we would very likely damage the uh, anti-fouling wiper systems that are on there or crack some of the ice and so it's pretty important that the sensors themselves remain below the freezing point. Um, so I can say that if you're deploying a system in freezing conditions it should be an iron or foam buoy rather than a plastic buoy just because they can take uh, the, the uh, crushing impacts of ice a lot better than say a polymer float. And so um, there's a number of systems that uh, can be designed that way. But um, frankly, a lot of people who are doing monitoring also will remove systems in winter months um, because of the challenges of monitoring that. Good. Thanks, Tim. Um, we're going to answer just a few more questions before we wrap it up. And um, uh, Tim, could you comment on uh, the Pisces, or I'm sorry, the harbor buoy, the small buoy, um, maximum velocity that it can handle? That is a great question, and that is something that is very dynamic. Um, the way I always answer this question is um, we have a uh, we have a platform selector guide. So if you go to YSI systems, and choose systems, there is a guide here that talks about the various deployment opportunity, uh, considerations. So frankly, all of there's a lot of things to consider, not just current velocity. You actually have to consider what the operational depth is. You have to consider the current speed. Uh, one thing that's very helpful is what's called sea state. So if you go on Wikipedia and look up the Beaufort scale, there's going to be a sea state rating uh, that says, based on these wind conditions and surface conditions, um, this is the sea state you're experiencing. And so all of our systems would be rated, say, the 68 buoy. It can operate at a sea state of 4, but it can survive a sea state of 8. It can operate in waters as shallow as 2 meters, but typically we would recommend that about 25 meters you move into a larger platform. Something like the Pisces system, again, can survive a sea state of eight. It's great in very shallow water, and it's great in high current flows. So six meters per second, um, six meters per second, I kind of covered that up, wouldn't be an unreasonable uh, current speed for the Pisces to survive in. 
So each of the systems has its advantages and disadvantages based on its size, its weight, its deployment capability. This guide at YSI Systems, and if you click on Systems, there's a floating platform product selector. It'll at least give you an idea of what the things you have to consider and um, choose an appropriate platform based on that. Good. Thanks, Tim. Um, we're going to wrap it up at this point, and if we were not able to answer your question uh, live today, we will get back to you uh, individually via email. So um, we thank you again for, for your attention today and for your participation, and we hope you found it informative. And Susan, I'd like to, to thank you for, for being our co-presenter. and. Um, Again, just to remind folks that this presentation has been recorded and we will make this available for you to listen to again um, starting tomorrow and you'll receive a link uh, to that recording at a later time. Again, thanks everyone for joining us and this concludes today's webinar.